Hi, everyone. I'm LeBron Hill, opinion and engagement reporter for the USA Today Network, Tennessee, an MC at the Storytellers Project. We, are, we so appreciate you taking a chance on live storytelling and sharing your evening with us. Tonight, we're joining Humana and five Americans from across the nation to create community. Since 2016, the Storytellers Project has brought more than 100 shows each year to communities across the country. But we've canceled our in-person season as part of the USA Today Net Network's response to the novel coronavirus. While it feels unsafe to be together in theaters, it feels necessary to be together online. So we've handpicked incredible storytellers and inspiring people to bring you a show about growing up. So let's say hi to our storytellers. First, we have up Jennifer Brown Hyde. Hello. O.V. Kabir. Hey, y'all. Jamie Satterfield. Hey, guys. Alex Hicks. Go Navy. <laughs> and Todd Shelley. Go balls. <laughs> so guys, I just want you to know, tonight is not going to be a TED Talk, not a Toastmasters, not a how-to talk, an inspirational speech, an educational lecture, or a slideshow. We won't sell you anything, but maybe a subscription. <laughs> This is storytelling, and storytelling is based on visiting. You open your heart and your mind, and you pay attention to a person you care about and want to feel closer to. So we invite you to do that tonight. I also want to prepare you for these stories tonight. Some of these storytellers will be polished and professional. Some will be raw and intense. We ask you to receive all of them, because that's how community change happens. One of tonight's stories will discuss child abuse. If you're being hurt, know someone who might be hurting or afraid you might hurt one another, help is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week at childhelp.org slash hotline or 1-800-4-A-CHILD. Now, we believe creating empathy and understanding is vital at all times, and especially in, in times of uncertainty. And with that, I am so excited to welcome our first storyteller, Jennifer Brown Hyde. Take it away, Jennifer. On July 15th, 1976, when I was nine years old, I boarded my school bus after a long day of summer school. Who was to know that that would be the longest bus ride? It would take me a few days to actually get home. As we left our school and traveled about 30 minutes down the road, dropping off a few children, there was a white van in the middle of the road blocking our bus from making the right-hand turn that we needed to make. Our bus driver, Edward, who was a local gentleman who was a farmer by day, drove our bus in the morning and the evening, stopped. Within seconds before anybody knew what was happening, two masked men with guns jumped on our bus. Edward was asked to get to the rear of the bus, and one of the kidnappers got in Edward's seat and drove our bus down the road. The fear had not really set in at that moment until I looked at my brother who was sitting midway in the bus and he looked back at me. I could see the fear in his eyes. At that point in time, the children had settled down and were quiet because we were all confused as to what was happening. One of the kidnappers drove our bus down the road just a few miles and then he drove off into an empty riverbed. There in that riverbed, there was another van that was waiting for us. That van quickly backed up to the bus and half the children were loaded into that van. There went my brother. We were separated. That van pulled away. The initial white van that was blocking our road backed up to the bus and the rest of the children, including myself and Edward, our bus driver, were loaded into that van and we drove off. It was over 100 degrees in the middle of July in the California heat. No bathrooms, no water, no food. No idea on where we were going. The kidnappers drove us around for 11 hours in the heat of the day, into the night, and into the next morning. I can remember they stopped a few times and the smell of gasoline was overwhelming. Obviously, they were stopping to refuel the vans. I also remember there was a very thin piece of plywood between the kidnappers and myself. I can remember hearing them have conversations 
I could hear them pop a soda can and I could hear them laughing while myself as a young child was fearful for my life. There was no restrooms, so we'd urinated all over ourselves. We were hot, we were sweaty, we were crying. After a few hours, the conversation ended amongst us children and we tried to sleep while the younger ones, as young as five years old, were crying for their mothers. I remember at one point in time, I yelled at those kidnappers. I was so upset. I said, when my dad gets a hold of you, you just wait. You're going to be in big trouble. The other kids and Edward told me to be quiet. Well, that was a little hard for me to do. That went on for 11 hours we were driven around. We stopped. Everything got quiet. The door of the van opened. Bright lights. I knew it wasn't sunlight because it was dark out. One by one, we were taken out of the van and things got quiet. All the other children exited. Edward got out. I was the last one left. I kept scooting back further and further, hoping that they would just forget about me. I was the mouthy one. I was the one that had been yelling at them. I was really fearful for what was going to happen next. They took me out. They asked me my name and my age. And they asked for a piece of clothing. I didn't have any clothing. All I had on was a pink swimsuit. We had been swimming that day at summer school. The clothes that I had had on had been taken off because it was so hot. Luckily for me, I had grabbed a shirt from the van when I exited, trying to cover myself because I was self-conscious. I handed the kidnappers whatever shirt I had. It wasn't mine. I didn't care. I just wanted to know where everybody else was. What was happening? What was going to happen next? When was I going to get to go home? They pointed to the ground and they said, climb down that ladder. What? I climbed down a 12 foot wooden ladder and there were the other children and Edward. They had actually buried a semi trailer in the ground. That was where we stayed for the next 16 hours. Luckily, they had provided us with food, water, and some makeshift toilets they had cut in the wheel wells. So finally we could go to the restroom, we could have something to eat, have some water. I finally got to see my brother after all those hours. Come to find out he was okay, I was okay. And then we waited. The food was gone, the water was gone. They had made some fans to pipe in some air. The batteries on those had stopped, there was no more air. So what next? One of the other children had a nightmare and kicked down a beam that was holding up the ceiling. The sand started to cave in. What was next? The older kids and Edward decided, you know what? I don't know that they're coming back for us. So they started to claw their way at the roof of where we came in. They'd stacked up some mattresses that were in the hole. Some of the older children come to find out there was a steel plate on top of the hole, diesel batteries on top of that, a wooden box and a bunch of sand. We had been buried in a rock quarry in Livermore, California, about six hours away from where we were actually taken. To anybody on the outside, it just looked like a sand dune. To us, we were actually buried alive. To 26 children and a bus driver, that was something that would last a lifetime. The hurt and the pain, the emotional scars, the fears, the anxiety, the stress, the not knowing, takes a ding on your self-control, takes a ding on your self-esteem, changes the person that you are and the person that you want to be. After a few hours of trying, luckily for us, the older children and Edward were able to escape. We got out, we were handed out one by one, sunlight. We had no idea where we were, didn't know what had happened to the kidnappers, but they weren't there. So we started walking. What a pitiful sight we were. 26 children, dirty, filthy, matted hair, a lot of us in swimsuits, no shoes. Edward, they had taken his pants from him. He had on a white t-shirt and his underwear. How embarrassing for him. 
it didn't matter at that point in time. We just wanted to get away from there as quick as we can. We went around a few bushes and to me, it looked like the Flintstones. We were at a rock quarry. It looked like bedrock. There was conveyor belts with rocks. There was heavy equipment. There was workers. They looked at us like we were, <laughs> like they had seen a UFO. We didn't know if they were involved in the kidnapping. We didn't know who they were. We said, hey, we're from Chachilla and we're lost. They said, oh my God, we've seen you on the news. They're looking for you. Somebody called the police. The SWAT team showed up. The FBI showed up. The police showed up. The city police, the county police, the sheriff's department, everybody was there. Then they had to figure out what were they going to do with 26 children. You couldn't put us in cop cars. They brought out a prison bus with black windows and iron bars on it. They put us in that bus, took us to a minimum security prison facility where they gave us some coveralls to put on. We got food, water, crayons. We got the color, take a nap, laugh, be kids for a moment. And then they had to figure out how were they going to get us back home? That was about a six hour drive. They brought a Greyhound bus, put us on a Greyhound bus and sent us home. That was a joyous time until the nightmares started. I couldn't even leave that place without having nightmares. Woke up screaming, terrified of the dark. Who knew that that would be a lifelong after effect of being buried alive? I'm still scared of the dark. I choose to sleep with a nightlight. Makes my life much better. We got back to Chachilla, got back to our tiny town, Looked like there was a million people there when we came home. I just wanted to go home. I just wanted to see my mom and dad. Finally, I was in my mom's arms. We loaded up into the station wagon and drove home. My mom gave me a bath, trying to wash the mildew out of my hair. Finally got to sleep. More nightmares. Couldn't even get through a night of nightmares without nightmares in my own home, safe with my mom sleeping next to me. Needless to say, there's a lifetime of nightmares that I'm living through. Even today, as we prepare to have a storm in Middle Tennessee, I have to be worried about, am I going to have to get in that storm shelter tonight? The physical scars that we had healed, the emotional scars are still with most of us after 40 some years. I will say that the effects that that had not only affected me, it affected generations what my poor parents went through to have their two children kidnapped, never to be known if they were ever gonna come home again. The effects it's had on my children, having to live with a helicopter mom, or as they call me, a Black Hawk mom, because I'm much more than a helicopter mom. Having to put your child on a school bus after you yourself have been kidnapped on a school bus is not an easy chore. Having to allow your child to go off to summer camp is not an easy chore. Just getting in the car with my family to take a trip down a country road on a Sunday afternoon is not an easy chore for me. I want to know where I'm going. When am I going to get there? What road are we going to take? After having my the control of my life taken away for those brief few hours and days have made me an individual that needs to be in control. I need to know where I'm going. When am I going to get there? How are we going to go? What roads are we going to take? My poor husband, I tell you, Sunday afternoon drive is not what it should be. I will say that I have lived a wonderful life. I've been blessed with a great husband and children. I have an awesome job. I have loving relationships with my parents who live close by. The lifelong effects of being kidnapped and buried along alive still stay with me. But I will say, I've made the choice to be a survivor and not a victim. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer, for sharing your powerful story. You know, uh, and thank you for your, your strength and vulnerability uh, to share that story. Just thank you. Um, and you at home can also show your appreciation for Jennifer's story uh, by clapping for her with the like button uh, and reactions. Um, I also want to take this time to thank Humana. Uh, Humana is sponsoring the Storytellers Project 
uh, all the shows nationally and now virtually because they believe that sharing stories and connecting uh, as humans online or in pers person makes for healthier people and for healthier communities. Uh, and we need these connections uh, to each other and to health now more than ever. Uh, as COVID-19 vaccinations become available in communities across the country, uh, Humana strongly encourage you to consider getting the vaccine and to discuss with your doctor what is best for your health. Uh, visit Humana dot com for more information about what they're doing each and every day to connect you to better health in your community. So now up next is our uh, our next storyteller, uh, O.V. Kabir, who will be sharing his story about growing up in Jellicoe, Tennessee. Please take it away. Hey, y'all. I'm super blessed to be here tonight with you all. So wherever you're listening to this, I appreciate y'all. Um, I grew up in a one stop light city on the border of Kentucky and Tennessee known as Jellicoe. Uh, and to give you an idea of how small this city is, uh, the hangout spot for while we were growing up was a parking lot of a gas station and an Arby's combined together. You see, this city was so small that when we got our first McDonald's, we thought about putting a parade on. And by first McDonald's, I mean our only McDonald's because we never got another one after that. Um, now, Similar to how small the city, the population was quite small too, and the population was predominantly white. Now, I'm not really sure where you're watching this, whether it's your phone, your laptop, or how good your connection is, but it doesn't take that hard of a look to realize that I don't really fit that description. You see, see my family is from Bangladesh. They're Bengali. My parents immigrated over 30 years ago from Bangladesh here to the United States. And you might be asking, like, out of all the cities they could have chose, all the places they could have gone, why did they go to Jellicoe, Tennessee? And I asked myself that question quite a few times too, but the thing is, uh, it was only one of the pit stops they ended up taking and they finally found themselves there. And my father, he's actually a doctor and he wanted to give health services to rural areas. So he found himself there. They moved here, but I was born here in the States. I was born as a first generation American. And because of that, and because of that, um, I love my country. I love my state. And it's something I want to fit in with the people around me, even though they look different than me. Because the culture I feel at that time felt 8,000 miles away, similar to where Bangladesh is. I didn't feel like that was me at the time. Growing up, I felt like I wanted to be the people around me. I wanted to fit in, not because I just wanted to. I felt like I had to because I didn't want to go to school and be made fun of for the color of my skin. I didn't want to be made fun of when I walked into the cafeteria and had food that smelled different than somebody else's. I didn't want to be made fun of because my family was Muslim and people would see me in a, with a lunchbox and say, when is that going to blow up? So I thought I'd make the jokes first. I'd make the jokes first so they would laugh with me, then it's at me. I would say that, hey, we are a sea of white marshmallows and I'm the only burnt marshmallow. Making people laugh around me, thinking that I'm appreciating my culture rather than appropriating it. You see, I wanted to fit in so bad that I had a mental image of who or what a Tennessean was. I thought a Tennessean was a person who was macho. Someone had a beer in their hand who sung Dolly Parton's nine to five, blared country music and wore boots everywhere, even to a wedding. See, I distinctly remember begging my mom, asking for her to buy me some boots. Even though they barely would fit me, they would go to my knees, I couldn't walk in them, but I wanted these Ariat boots because I saw everyone wearing them. So my mom, like the loving, caring mother she is, who didn't want her son to be bullied anymore, um, she bought me Skechers. Uh, Probably the best decision she probably made because those boots did not, would not look at me good at, on me. And I wore Skechers, but I wanted to fit in. I tried to find, find ways to fit in. I thought I did, but other people didn't. Um, and I remember when I was 14, um, it was my first girlfriend and uh, one of my first girlfriends. And I met her family. And this was a big deal for me because I was raised that you have to, your first impression is a big deal. So I was thinking in my head, going down the checklist, firm handshake, look into his eyes, be respectful. So I get to the door. He comes out and he shakes my hand, firm handshake. I look into his eyes and he leans into me and he says, I usually wouldn't be fine with this, but you're one of the good ones. Your father is too. And that comment stayed with me. It brought out a lot of questions to me at that time and also later that I wouldn't answer till late years down the line. It made me think, what did he mean? What We were one of the good ones. What does that actually mean? Does that mean that my dad's a doctor, so we're one of the good ones? Does it mean that I had good grades or were one of the good ones or because I was on the basketball team, even though I was the eighth man on the bench, I averaged two points every season, which is really not that relevant. So probably that wasn't the point, but why were we the good ones? What he probably meant was that the brown people that he thought he met or he met, they weren't like us. They were different. They were bad. What is a Jellicoe, Tennessee, a sea of marshmallows? What brown people is he meeting? 
Well, he probably had a conceived, like, preconceived idea in his head, and that dictated the actions he took and spoke with me at that time. And it wasn't until I realized this until I moved to a bigger city, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, about 45 minutes out. We moved there from my high school. My family moved there. And so when you go to a bigger city, you find a bigger community. And within that community, there was a diversity of people. I saw people who looked like me, who people who didn't look like me, people who just weren't white. The diversity in all different ways. And so I started feeling like I could be myself a little bit more. I wanted to share a little bit more. I remember my sophomore year. I took a picture of myself and my family. It was for Eid, a Muslim holiday, where I wore a cultural outfit, a Punjabi, and I posted it on my Instagram. And I remember my comments being flooded at the time where people were like, this is so great. This is so awesome. You look so great in this. And it's, uh, it was such a confident boost for me because I was like, this is my culture. This is awesome. But little did I realize I was wearing a cultural outfit like somebody would wear it on Halloween, one time a month, one time a year, or they would go out there for compliments. To me, that's what I thought it was. It wasn't my culture because your culture is so much bigger than just an outfit, than just the food. It's about where you come from, the things behind it. And it wasn't until I realized this until the summer of my college, before my college years, I went down to Bangladesh with my family. And we've been there multiple times before, but this time it was different because I had my eyes open a little bit. I wanted to look at parts where I didn't look at before, beautiful parts, and start to realize this country that I come from, my motherland, it found its independence in 1971. Now in 2021, that's 50, less than 50 years. This country has been independent for less than 50 years. A country that's one third the population size of the United States, over 100 million people, but 100 the size of the United States, and it's thriving. So this filled me with pride. This made me realize that the country I come from, my motherland, it's an amazing country. And if it wasn't for those people there, I wouldn't be here today. So going into the University of Tennessee, where I went later for college, that's where I started bringing that experience to me. I started meeting people because when you go to a college, you meet people from a whole different walks of life, people who look like me, talk like me, who said the same language, who shared the same stories that my parents did. I started feeling like I belonged to the community that I didn't need to assimilate it. And it was great. I was like, finally, I'm a Bangladeshi, I'm a Bengali American. And I was associating primarily with people like this. And then I remember one day, it was uh, my freshman year of college. My my long, my childhood friend, somebody I've known since I was a kid, he came out as gay to me. He opened up and something that he was conflicted in, him finding his own identity. And he told me about his struggles, about coming out and how he was unsure, how it scared him, how he didn't know anything. He was worried about my reaction. And my reaction was, I was surprised because this never happened before. But for me, this was the same guy I've always loved, who I've played with, talked to. We did everything together. And this, this is my best friend. So in my mind, it didn't change anything. I accepted him for who he was because that's how I was raised. You accept those who, no matter what, and you love them for who they are. I wanted him to live his life. But what I found out, and it's unfortunate in many cultures, many, many heritages, different places, that uh, there are certain people within these cultures that have this conservative social ideology where – Within my community, there were members, not all of them, but there were members who didn't feel like the LGBTQ community should have the same rights as they did. They didn't feel like they should be able to marry. They didn't feel like they should be able to love openly. They didn't feel like if we knew somebody who was open like that, we should approach them. And I'm not saying that was everybody in my but these were people that I was hanging out with, people that looked like me, talked like me, spoke the language, taught me how to cook, some friends I made in college. But they had these values that I didn't share. And so I felt like, what am I going to do now? When I was growing up, there was a community that I tried to simulate, even though I didn't feel completely in it. And now going to college, now there's a new community that I want to be part of, but there's people who don't share the same values. But that's when I figured out, I was like crossroads, that I can still love my culture. I can still love my community. I can still love where I'm from, but whole different values sometimes. And it kind of came full circle for me when shortly after graduating college, I found myself on a reality TV show. And on this TV show, it was kind of unique because some of the episodes are live where millions of people see you in live time. I remember the first episode I thought about, the first live episode, I was thinking in my head that how do I want to show who I am, what I am to people? I want to show them that I am proud of who, where I am from and who I am. So the first live episode, I put a cultural outfit on. I put a Punjabi on, pure red. But on top of it, I put a power tea pin, a T that shows that I'm from Tennessee, that shows what my alma mater is, that I'm proud because I'm not just a Bangladeshi, I'm not just a Tennessee, I'm both. I'm a Bangladeshi American, I'm proud to be both of them. And I'm not just a brown marshmallow. I'm who I am and that's my identity. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoyed my story. All right. uh
thank you so much, uh, Ovi, for sharing your uh, your journey of self identity. Uh, that's really awesome. Um, as a small as a fellow small towner, uh, I can certainly empathize with you. But however, my hometown celebrated when there was a Chick Fil A that opened up. <laughs> a little different, but uh, but same thing. Uh, <laughs> um, Fingers crossed. Maybe one day we'll get one down there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, guys, uh, if, if you loved uh, Ovi's story, uh, please show him. Uh, you can clap for uh, for him uh, with the like button reactions. Uh, so next up, uh, we have uh, Knoxville uh, a New Sentinel reporter, Jamie Satterfield. Uh, hello there. How you doing, Jamie? I'm feeling good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. All right, you can take it away. All right. Well, folks, I am Jamie Satterfield, and I've spent about 30 years being an investigative journalist. I've told a lot of stories of suffering in my time. What I've never done is tell my story. In fact, if you've ever heard me speak, uh, you would think that my life began in 1988 when I met my hunk of a husband and got a job as a newspaper reporter, even though I didn't have a journalism degree. That's usually where I start my story. But of course, like everybody, I have a backstory. And tonight, really, for the first time in my life, I'm going to share it, and I hope that God will use it. Um, when I was born, I was very uh, intelligent, gifted. I could read by age three. By age six, I could uh, decipher legal documents, sort of a portend to come. Um, but at the same time, in my home life, I suffered greatly, as did my mother. Uh, my father was a coal miner, but he was also an alcoholic whose father had beat his mother and children. And so therefore he beat his wife and children. Um, and uh, that was my experience for the first 10 years of my life. I would go to school and I'd be the smart girl. So I had very few friends. They liked to stick me in corners with books. But I loved school because it was safe and the teachers uh, really loved me uh, and, and honored my intelligence. And so thank God for schools, public education. But, it, but when I went home, uh, it was always, uh, you were always afraid. You never knew, would he come home drunk and mad or would he come home feeling sorry for what he had done the night before and bring you a Wonder Woman t-shirt? You just never knew. You couldn't have friends over. Uh, I worried to death about my mama. Of course, she took the brunt of that. And she herself had been a victim of, of rape in her youth. That's how I'm here today, frankly. She was a young um, teenager. Uh, but my dad died when I was 10. Um, and uh, I next wound up uh, in the grasp of child molesters. Uh, a lady that babysat uh, me uh, and, and my siblings uh, had a couple, uh, well, actually I had three sons who favored young girls my age. I was about 10, 11 years old, I guess. Um, and so they would routinely, uh, sometimes separately, sometimes together, uh, rape me. Uh, and this was an old lady and they just find me, I'd try to hide or sit, you know, stick next to her. That went on for a couple of years. I never told anybody, just as I never discussed what was going on in my home life when my dad was alive. And that included my mother. I didn't tell my mother. And uh, it was through the grace of God that we moved from those coal mining towns when I was 13, uh, uh, going on 14, we moved to Sevier County, Tennessee, and uh, there I went to uh, Gatlinburg Pittman High School, and uh, a guidance counselor there took an interest in me, Don Bohannon. He's one of my angels, but uh, he made sure that even though I was dirt poor, that when I got an offer to get a, a summer scholarship at Yale University as a junior, and I told him I couldn't go because I didn't have the money. He went around to businesses and raised the money. And so when I came to Sevier County, Tennessee, for the first time in my life, I was safe and I was free on the outside. On the inside, I could not account 
for why these people had done these things. I, I could not understand the why me. And so I figured I must be broken. I must be bad. I attract this. And that kind of thinking, while on the one hand, I'm the valedictorian at my high school, I'm working full time, I'm helping my mama, who at this point is a single mother with, with four children and going to school herself. And I am uh, on the outside uh, looking like I got it all together, but I was suffering from bulimia, anorexia, and alcoholism. In high school, I was gang raped, never told anybody. And that was uh, alcohol uh, played a role in that. And then when I was in college, I went to the University of Tennessee. I got a full ride. I could have gone to Harvard, Yale, Princeton. I turned them all down. And, and I'll be frank, I did that because you all in East Tennessee loved me and I wanted to stay here. And I went to the University of Tennessee and I did very well. But I also uh, would go out uh, as all college students do. And inevitably I would wind up drunk and date raped. That happened, I can't tell you how many times, never told anybody. And then the final, uh, incident leading up to my 21st birthday um, was I met a man who was older than me. He was a drug addict um, and a very abusive, uh, beat me and, and threatened me at gunpoint. It, it went on for, and I was in UT at the time, uh, taking a full load of classes and working full time and every other night getting my butt kicked um, and thinking I deserved it. Um, and, and of course, so I didn't reach out for help. In fact, I openly resisted help because it was my fault. Um, and uh, around my 21st birthday, I don't know what snapped in me, but I said enough is enough. And I told this fellow I didn't want anything else to do with him. A few days went by. I was working uh, at a grocery store here in town. And uh, I walked out in the parking lot. And uh, next thing I know, I was being shoved up against a truck. My head was being bashed up against a truck. And here this fellow was. He threw me in his truck. He kidnapped me. He took me into another county. Uh, he beat me uh, first in front of a cop at a store. Uh, I won't name that county, but for many years, I wouldn't go in it. Uh, then he took me to some house, didn't know where I was, held me there for three days, raped me repeatedly, threatened to kill me. I eventually convinced him that we were reconciling and I convinced him to go get some food. And as soon as he left, I took off naked and barefoot running and a trucker rescued me. And all I kept saying was, Please take me back to Sevier County. Just take me back to Sevier County. I'll be safe there. And he did. And I wound up at the hospital and there were cops that came, some detectives. Uh, the Sevierville officers that I talked to were very nice and they took reports and they told me how to get warrants. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, the victim had to get her own warrant. And we got a series of warrants against this fella for, for all the crimes that he had committed. And they told me when to show up for court. And so I did. And I was so scared. But they told me somebody would meet me there and it would be okay. And I'm 21 years old. My bones at that point, some of them were still broken. I think my eyes were still purple. They had been swollen shut. And I walked into a Cobb County courthouse in Cock County, Tennessee. And a fella in a uniform came over and I told him my name. And he said, oh yeah, the judge wants to see you. And he took me back to what I now know as the judge's chambers. And there was my attacker sitting there. And the judge was at his desk. And I froze. And he said, sit down, it's all right. 
And what he proceeded to tell me was that my attacker was from a good family. And though he had some problems, I must have caused this. And so he was going to dismiss all of these charges. And I just needed to stay out of Cobb County. That's what he told me. And I said, Judge, will you give me 15 minutes and keep him back here 15 minutes? And he said, yeah, I'll do that. And I took off running. I got in my car. I'm sorry. And I drove as fast as I could back to the Sevier County line. And for years, I wouldn't go back to Cock County. So it is that woman who found herself in a newsroom for a job I was not qualified for. When the phone rang in 1992, I joined the uh, newspaper in Sevierville in 1988. I married my husband in 1989. In 1992, the phone on my desk rang. And it was a man. He wouldn't tell me who he was. And he said, there's an inmate at the Sevier County Jail. And he's raped a child. He has AIDS. And nobody is telling the family so that the child can be tested. And you need to do something about it. And he hung up. And that was the first time I felt it. All I can describe it is this burning in your chest and you know you gotta help her. You can, you gotta save this child. I had no idea who, she, who, I didn't know if it was a she. But that sprang up in me. And I went home and I told my husband that I had no idea how in the world I was gonna figure that out. There were 20 inmates over there charged with child rape. Heck, I didn't even know they charged people for doing that and they never charged them in mine. But I did, I, I spent, I can't tell you how many hours praying and crying and working, asking, begging, looking through documents. And my husband said a strange thing to me. He said, Jamie, if you go on like this, if you don't learn to channel those emotions and that, that pain, you're gonna self-destruct. And you'll be of no use to anybody. So you got to pace yourself. You got to take care of yourself. Well, if he were alive today, he'd tell you, I didn't pace myself. I didn't take care of myself, but he sure did. But I was able to find out who that fellow was. I was able to call up the DA's office and say, what you all have done is terrible. And you need to fix it. So you call this family. You tell them the truth. And then I went to the legislature and I said, let's pass some laws so that when a child gets raped by somebody with a disease that can kill them, we have to tell them. We don't protect the bad guy here. We have to protect the victim. And I got two laws passed as a result of that. And I was hooked on journalism. But throughout my career, I still carried all of that pain in me. And I still never felt like I measured up. In fact, every time I was able to do good for others in my work, it was almost like I was redeeming myself. Now, that's crazy, isn't it? I've lived a very good life. And I did the same thing in my personal life. I had to be the best mom, the best wife, the best Christian. And I put so much pressure on myself because I never told anybody what happened to me and maybe if I had somebody would have said it's not your fault it's not your fault and so that's why I did not know it was going to end with this flamey tears but that's why I'm speaking tonight so that if you are being hurt <laughs> tell somebody and that final thing I want to say is my husband, on his deathbed, he died in 2015 of cancer. But before he died, he met with each family member and had a separate speech with each one. And I watched him do that. I didn't 
invade those privacies, but I watched him do that, that process. And I knew my time was coming and it was. He sat me down, he held my hand and he said, I've got something to tell you and I need you to believe me. And I said, okay, honey. Now he's on morphine at this time. I want to, he's, he's tearing up and being a big uh, emotional guy at that point. So I really wasn't ready for what he said, but what he said was, you're an angel. And I laughed and I was sitting there thinking, maybe I ought to cut that morphine down a little bit. But he was earnest and he held my hand and he was, he started going back through my suffering and the story he could link it to or the child I'd helped and taken in or what I had taught my children how to be as character and how to love people and be kind and forgive. And he linked all of that for me. And what he made me realize is everything that I suffered has had purpose. So if you're suffering, know that it has purpose. Today, despite my boo I am the happiest I've ever been. And I miss my husband every day. But I am the happiest I've ever been. Because today I know the truth. And that is, I'm an archangel. I've suffered greatly. And I've used it for good. And no one will ever tell me different. And the other thing is, they'll have to fire me. Because for the rest of my life, for the rest of my life, I will devote my career to giving a voice to those who suffer in silence and giving a voice to people who are treated like trash by our court systems because they're poor. I will dedicate the rest of my career to making right the things that are wrong. And instead of all of us sitting around and complaining about what's wrong, why don't each of us go out and take our pain and our suffering and use it for good and help somebody else. Of all, the, of all the things that were committed against me and of all the people that were involved, I have no bitterness. I don't even, I, I couldn't tell you names anymore. They were sick too. And that's what we need to realize people. We've got to love each other and help each other. So I'm sorry, I probably went over time and I've, I've been a big baby. But as you can see, I felt that this is what God wanted me to do. I didn't want to do it, but he said, go. So I went, thank you very much. Uh, wow, Jamie, um, thank you uh, so much for your strength uh, and for your courage. Uh, uh, to tell that story. Um, Thank you. you know, I hope you help somebody. Yeah, you know, as someone who's who's an avid uh, reader of your work, you know, it's, it's great to to hear the why behind it. You know, that's that, it's, it was powerful. Thank you. All right. So, uh, just in case, uh, I'll let you guys know uh, if anyone, if you or anyone you know uh, has been a victim of sexual assault or is currently. Um, please contact uh, the National Sexual Assault, Hot, uh, Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-4673. Uh, 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 please, please do. Um, all right, uh, so next up uh, we have uh, Alex uh, Hicks, who will be uh, telling his uh, childhood story of moving uh, from, to the, from the city of Chicago to Missouri. Hello, Alexander, how are you doing? Whoa, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing good, all right, take it away. All right. Uh, my name is Alexander Hicks. I'm uh, the chief photographer of the uh, at the Gannett paper at the Spartanburg Herald Journal. And uh, you're probably wondering why I'm holding this rock. And I'll explain it as I explain my story. Um, I grew up in St. Louis and Chicago. But before that, my family is a family from Mississippi. And uh, uh, I hadn't been down to Mississippi that much or whatever. And by, but my grandfather had 16 kids and my father was one of them. Uh, and uh, so it was like a uh, lack of a 
better things. You know, he was an older man. So I, he's probably like 80 when I was uh, a little boy. Uh, and he, well, I guess I was probably about seven or eight. And he called and, and, and he had this ritual where he would call the grandchildren down. And we didn't go all at one time because there were so many of us. But I came down to uh, to Mississippi. I was brought down there to meet him and and, and experience what my uh, my family was from. So I always remember Irving Alexander Hicks. We call him Papa. I come out and Papa was standing there and he was a giant, even though he wasn't that big of a man. And he came and and naturally I just looked at him because, you know, they're telling me that was my grandfather. And he took the kids out alone. And he reached his hand down and instinctively, I don't know why, I felt so comfortable that I put my little hand in his hand and he walked me out to this cotton field. My, uh, my family were sure, you know, my dad and, and, and my grandfather and, and people before that, uh, my father's side of the family is from Mississippi. So I, I, I didn't, I'm a kid from Chicago. I knew nothing about, uh, cotton fields and all that. But uh, but uh, in the palm of uh, his hand, I put my hand and I walked out. And it's the first time that I can really remember. I've probably been there before or whatever. But the first time I could really remember. And I looked down and I looked up and saw all this cotton on a blue sky. And it was beautiful. And he looked at me and he, and he started to tell me tales about when he was a boy and his grandfather and how they had worked the land and how they had picked cotton. Now, cotton, uh, he, he, you know, he was Mississippi in the 20s and probably, you know, I'm just trying to get up the age, but he grew up in Mississippi in the, uh, the teens and 20s. And it was probably pretty harsh on him, but he was not a bitter man. And as I walked through this cotton field, he, he took a little, you know, he, he uh, kind of went down and he took a bulb of cotton and like, boom, surgical precision. I bought it and, all, I, I, and he held it in front of me and I didn't know what he was holding. So as, as most kids, I kind of imitated him and I picked that cotton and I tried to do it like him and I ripped my hand wide open and he looked at me and everything and he looked down at my hand and he said, uh, uh, you, you're not a cotton farmer. You're not. A, you're not a sharecropper. But you. So you better get an education. That stuck with me at the age of seven. Uh, even you know, uh, just the power of that imagery of that cotton field and all the people that had worked that land before me for probably two hundred years, because that's where my dad's family probably didn't leave Mississippi until we were the first ones to born up in Chicago. But I knew right then and there, and he was telling me in his own way of not having an education. He didn't have an education. He wasn't afforded. He wasn't given those options. But he looked at me, and he probably couldn't articulate it or whatever, but he wanted me to get an education. And I knew right then and there that that was a very honorable thing that they had done all, all that. But all the years of picking cotton and everything. That was an honorable profession, uh, you know, when they were sharecroppers and before then, you know, in enslavement and everything. But I had choices that they did not have. That stuck with me. So we'll fast forward up until the time that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll fast forward up until the time uh, because uh, I, I grew up in Chicago and in and, and Chicago, uh, my parents, uh, divorce when I was probably shortly after that trip to, uh, to Mississippi, but, uh, up in Chicago, I loved Chicago. I had, I, I, I loved, I, I loved the community I lived in. It was all black. We were all poor, but we had a great deal of pride and I had a lot of fun. I, I really didn't understand how important being raised in Chicago was for me. But, but anyway, when I was about, uh, like I said, about shortly after that, we moved to St. Louis and boy, I was in for a rude awakening in St. Louis because uh, 
we moved out to the suburbs where I, I was probably one of 13 kids in, in my uh, in my school district that was black and the, the rest of them were all white. And uh, and I, uh, you know, it, I looking back at and everything, I just, you know, I desperately wanted to not so much fit in. I just wanted to be a kid and everything. And it was really hard sometimes. I had friends and I loved my friends and everything. And, uh, uh, but you know, some of my closest friends, we were on the other side of uh, Jennings where I grew up and uh, in St. Louis Jennings and uh, it, which is that part was more uh, predominantly black. So we, we were just on that side of the city and some of my friends thought it was really comfortable to, well, we, we got to get out of here. There's too many blankety blank N words. And I kind of looked over and I didn't know what to say. These are my friends that I've known all my life. But they thought it was comfortable to say that word. Now, I'm not saying they were bad people or whatever, but that's a powerful mission. That, that's a powerful message that they were telling me that they thought it was uncomfortable to say that to me. And uh, to this day, I won't say I'm bitter, but, uh, you know, I really understood how people could be tone deaf. They could look you in the eye. They could know you every day of your life. And sometimes just be tone deaf to what they're doing. So I learned right then and there that my upbringing in St. Louis and Chicago and Mississippi, what, I had to value it because it taught me. The, my heritage and uh, quite frankly, how to live with people sometimes that I, I would work with and I would love and, and all that. But boy, they could really drop a bomb sometime on you. So I, I really understood that I was mis misunderstood because I remember one time my, you know, it was my senior, my senior year in high school or whatever. And uh, we had a yearbook and my mom came and sat down beside me and she opened the yearbook and she wanted virtually to see my, uh, my uh, picture in the yearbook. And, and then they had nicknames and they had the nickname of Lou. And my mom said, what do you, why is your nickname Lou or whatever? I, said, I don't know why, you know, I, I knew uh, because the only black person that most of the people that knew on the staff of the yearbook, my fellow students and things like that was Lou Brock, the great baseball player who happened to be black. And they kind of nicknamed me Lou. Uh, my And I'll never forget the look in my mother's face when she looked and just kind of just shook her head and walked off. But th that that told me that uh, that wasn't all right to be called Lou, but she, but we dealt with it. But anyway, when I got a little bit older, I joined the Navy primarily because I wanted to uh, not, I wanted to travel, I wanted to see the world. And I, uh, uh, and my parents, you know, I didn't want my parents to have the burden of uh, uh, sending me to, to college because I knew if I went in the military, I could, I could uh, get a scholarship or whatever. I, I won a scholarship, went to Syracuse University, traveled the world. And I, I, and as I traveled the world and met people, I learned that the way that I had been, that heritage, uh, the traditions that my grandfather had taught me uh, about to be proud, to be proud to be proud of who you are and to do better. He always would tell me, it's like a mantra in my family, do better. This is a man, uh, my grandfather was so special to me. This is a man that was not afforded an education that, 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 that only had the option of working the lands and, and uh, working the land and uh, just being what other things thought, other people thought he should be. So we'll fast forward up into my life now. And uh, 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 I look at my son, uh, my dad's oldest brother, uh, uh, Uncle Luke. I didn't know him very much because he was away in the military when I was a little boy. But he came back. And after my dad died, he said, boy, I'm going to take you down to the Mississippi or whatever. And uh, and I and I said, well, you know, uh, and he goes, well, you got a son. So he took my son who was probably, well, we, me, Uncle Luke and my son, Stefan, uh, jumped in the car 
and we took a trip to 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 Mississippi. And what was so I, I didn't know the power of what happened to me when I was eight. But as I got out uh, out the car and and we did a couple of things, but I my son would always hold his hand up and uh, like dad take my hand when he was eight and we would walk together. And my my uncle Luke, he had gone through all this with his brothers and, and he was one of the last OGs as we call the original gangster Hickses uh, because, you know, they were old. But as I my son took took my hand and we walked out in that same cotton field. He started asking me questions about that. And I said, no, this is where your grandfather and, and his father and everything, they worked the land here. And he looked down at me. My son looked at me because I'm a very blessed man. I've never had very things happen to me badly or anything like that. But he looked down at me and he says, dad, I want to take some of these rocks. And uh, Uncle Luke said, Uncle, my uncle looked at me, uh, Luke looked at me and he said, well, go over there where the old house is. And then, uh, so we went over to where the house and, and, and I, and, and my son started to gather these rocks and these, 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 uh, these rocks are where their, their, their sharecropper shack was and everything. And he was so proud to put these in his to, to put these in this pocket and, and we still have them today. He's 23. He's a student up in Clemson trying to figure out what he wants to do his life. But I realized right in there that I had an obligation and my son, I wish I, I, I hope I've instilled in him to do better, to do better. That's the mantra. Just, you know, it's, I've, this country has given me so much in education, I've traveled around in the Navy and everything. I've got a beautiful son. I've chose to live in Spartanburg, South Carolina, because it's not too big, not too small, but it's, I feel like it's my Mississippi. I feel like I'm going to show him uh, how to do better here. So, but that's pretty much my story. And uh, thank you for uh, letting me share a, a part of my life. Wow. Uh that was that was great, uh, Alex. Uh, thank you for sharing your story of hard work and determination. Uh, you know, it was powerful to you know to hear about how you maneuvered between a predominantly black community and then a predominantly white community. That was uh, that was really awesome to hear. All right. Uh, so if you guys uh, enjoy Alex's story, uh, please uh, please show him by clapping uh, with the like button uh, and also with the reactions. All right. Uh, so right now, I'm going to take this time to thank our uh, our subscribers. Uh, we are so thankful for our subscribers uh, because you uh, support this community's uh, journalism. For those who aren't subscribers, uh, we appreciate you giving us the chance to show you our value uh, tonight and hope you consider a digital subscription uh, at the Tennessean, uh, Knoxville News, the Greenville News, uh, and so many other uh, publications close to you. Uh, journalists in those markets uh, coach the nice uh, tellers, just so you know. Uh, so lastly, uh, we have uh, Todd Shelley uh, as our, our last storyteller for the event. How you doing, Todd? Doing marvelous. How you doing? Doing all right, man. Please. Well, I'm here. Please so take it oh, yep. okay. My name is Todd Shelley, and I'm I'm honored to be here tonight as one of the storytellers. And I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're kind of nestled in the foothill of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Very beautiful, and I'm proud to call Knoxville my home. A little about me. I was born with congenitive rubella syndrome, or AKA German measles. And um, if you don't know much about it, it's an airborne virus. And if a woman's pregnant and she could touch, she gets the virus, it can be detrimental to the child in the womb. It can cause severe disability intellectually and physical and even death. Um, rubella did affect my life. I was paralyzed from my face to the left side, um, nerve damage in my eye and speech hearing and more intellectual disabilities, but we'll get to that. But when I was about three months old, I stopped breathing. Subconscious, I didn't know this, but I was a fighter. My fight started in the kindergarten. Um, I didn't realize I was very really different until I got to school. Um, I don't remember my kindergarten teacher's name at all. Sorry, but I do remember Susan. Susan used to take me out of the class. We took 10 steps across to another room, open the door, tiny little table, tiny little kindergarten chairs. 
she would sit down with me and we would go through the letters because I couldn't speak very well. My words would come up clearly. So we go through the T's, the Z's. I struggle with S, like street, sign, speak, um, Z's, zebras. I just struggled with this. But at that moment, I realized no other kid was in there with me. It was just me and Susan. Susan would take me back to the classroom. I would sit down at the table, and my classmates would ask me, where did you go? That would be a question I would be asked many times through my school years. Um, I got tested a lot as a kid. And the thing about it, I never understood why I was getting tested. I just knew I was getting taken out of class. Sometimes I have a woman or a man sit there, observe me for three or four days in the back of the class. And I felt like I was different because they were just staring, they, they were sticking me out there by myself. I was just tired of getting tested. And I couldn't make up what was going with me. All I knew, I felt different. But I didn't realize I was blessed to have really good classmates. 95% um, of people for me in school were very nice to me. But middle school, I started figuring out people can be mean. Remember walking down the hallway, he had tan khaki pants on, a white shirt, blonde hair. Next thing I know, something hits me in the face and it hurt. Hits me again in the face and it hurts. At that moment, he had rubber bands out. He was shooting at me in my face. I fell to the ground, I caught up in the ball like a rolling pony because it hurt, and all I remember is, stop, stop. And all he could say to me is, I'm trying to make your eyes straight. That's when I realized bullies are real. And throughout my life, I had people basically make fun of the way I talk. And they try to act like the way I talk. And deep inside, I laugh it off, but I was really hurting. It really bothered me. And I still get tested, and tested more and more. And all this time, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I just knew I was different and I felt different. Um, even though I have wonderful friends, I had a great supporting family, um, I was well liked, I still had a darkness inside me that just didn't fit in. By the time I got to high school, I started realizing um, I wasn't in the same classes as my friends. I wasn't doing what everybody was doing. My friends would be in AP class, honors, getting ready for college, and me, you walk down this hallway, go behind the auditorium, behind the curtains. Oh, you pass the in school suspension room. Then you find the room I'm at, resource. I got stuck with my friends using algebra, geometry, chemistry. I was reading adding and subtraction, how to read a decimal. That's where I was at. Even though I had great friends, we'd go on Friday nights, Saturday to Dunkin' Donuts, drink our coffee, talk about life. I still didn't feel like I fit in. Even they loved me, I just knew I wasn't going to go the same path as them. Um, over time, I worked really hard on my self-esteem. I felt really down on myself. I, I didn't like who I was. Um, I was embarrassed to look at the mirror at myself. But I pushed through it. I had to prove to myself I could do this. I got to graduate college. I mean, high school. My bad, so sorry. And then came to a time I started doing good in school. I did so good, my mom and dad even called the school on the report card and go, are you sure you got the right kid? Yes, but that all changed. One day, some people in my school districts took me in a room. I was sitting in the left-hand chair, some of the right-hand chair. Somebody in front of me, and they Mr. Sheely, we'd like for you to drop out of school, go get your GED, go down the street, go work at this place, minimum wage job, because of all you're going to amount to in life. He was a kid his whole life trying to find himself, trying to do school. It was hard enough as it was. Worked all the way up to my senior year, and you tell me to drop out? Yeah, that stung. And then when I went to the resource class, I used to have kids knock the books out of my hand and go, you're going to a dumb class? So I started putting all my books in my backpack. Nobody can knock my books out of my backpack. That's where I thought. But I had one thing in my back pocket while my friends went off to college, applying for school, doing all this cool stuff. I had drums. Yes, drums started for me. It was my escape. But it started for me at vacation Bible school. I was going to play the trumpet for Go Tell It on the Mountain. Obviously, I wasn't that good. My teacher's like, Mr. Sheely, trumpet's not your thing. And back in my mind, thank goodness somebody thinks that too. But she goes, here, I have a drum. 
It's a Native American drum of Cherokee, North Carolina. She put it in front of me. As soon as I hit that drum, man, the energy in me, I found my love. Drums will come my escape. Drums was me. I live, breathe drums. I mean, as soon as I get home from school, play drums. I used to have an imaginary band in the basement of my house. I would visualize me playing from thousands of people. And my band, my imaginary band was Anton Witt and the Igloos. Anton Witt was my sax player and I was that drummer. And then we would start every show because my family's from Ohio. Hello, Cincinnati. Hello, Toledo. That's how my shows always started out. But that was the time that was healing for me because I struggled with my self-esteem. I didn't know what I was good at. And while everybody went off to college, all I had left was drums. Fortunate for me, I had a wonderful drum teacher. And while I was in, college, in high school, he allowed me to do an internship with him at the music store. I got to learn about drums, maple, butch shells, cymbals, hi-hats, you name it, I learned it. And the time, I started playing around town. I played for the first two years for free, then played for the tip jar, finally got paycheck. Yeah, making progress. But I kept playing, playing to the point I was doing eight shows, seven days a week. I was slammed. I found my identity. I found who I was for once. The time I started touring, my last band, I did seven years on the road, about 275 to 300 days a year. Through all this time, I still didn't know what's wrong with me. I still didn't think I belong. I look in the mirror, my eye might be lazy. I talk different. I didn't feel like I believed in myself. Even though drums, I felt I was good at it. I still had that missing link inside of me. That missing link like, who am I? You know? Then at the time the band got going and we did a contest for Bonnery, one of the biggest music festivals in the country. We won it. Finally, this guy, after playing smoky bars to nobody, nobody would listen. Sometimes people wouldn't even clap. Yes, I paid my dues. I made it to the big leagues. I'm at Bonnery. Everything I want and I can have was there, except one problem. A month earlier, I was on a cruise ship playing, found out my band is going to break up. I passed to Cuba in the middle of the ocean, found my band house could be gone. My band is done. And my one thing I thought I was good at my whole entire life was drums was about to be gone. I had to play Bonnaroo, everything I had was gone. I lost it. I was lost with a deep depression to a point like I didn't want to be here anymore. Who am I? What's wrong with me? Why didn't it work out? I played victim mode for a long time. But I had to change my mindset and I did. I realized depression is just an emotion. Just like happiness is an emotion. You pick that emotion, that's your outcome. I started changing my mindset. Good things are on this way. Good things are on the way, Todd. Something magical is going to happen. And guess what? It did. Photography. Just happened. My younger brother, after the band, goes, hey, dude, why you do you walk dogs? You love animals. So I decided to do that. Just happened to be in a family's house. I was watching the Great Danes, the Davis family. We talked about photography. My last year touring the band, I got bored. And I started doing photography on this little tablet. And they go, well, you know what? We have a Nikon camera. You'd like to try it out. Yeah. As soon as I got that camera in my hand, I was hooked. The only thing that stopped me was I was literally blind in my left eye and colorblind in my right eye. Can I do photography being colorblind? I don't see blue, red, or green. What does the sky look like? I don't know, but I'm going to try my best. I spent hours and hours on YouTube trying to learn photography, learn shading. Um, how can I tell this guy it's blue gray? I don't know. I have a lot of friends, a lot of help, and opened a lot of doors to meet wonderful people in Knoxville, photographers, and led me to a newspaper article, led me to a news show, and more people, and things started growing for me. Guess what? It was a drum thing for me. I found my calling, something I love deeply. And I didn't know squat about it when I started. All I knew is I love the creativity behind it. Um, to me, a while, I don't understand the focus length. My depth perception is different. But it's okay. It's okay to be different. It's okay to be you. And through that time, doing photography, I started doing showcases, selling my work. I started feeling good about myself. But one thing was missing. What's wrong with me? 
Why do I not catch on like everybody else? Why, why I'm sitting here struggling? Then it dawned on me, I go, I'm, I want to see what's going on. I got tested for two weeks at the University of Tennessee. I got a 20 page report about me, about me. Everything on this report came back and said I was below average. Reading, math, auditory process disorder, very below average. Um, pretty much out of this 20 page report, I was a below average man. But guess what? I learned something about myself that day. The time moves on, good things do happen. And what I learned that day is a piece of paper does not define who I am as a man. I learned my whole life, I was searching for who I was. In reality, I only found out who I was. And when I saw that paper, it didn't matter anymore. I overcame so much, I was proud of myself, you know? And I go back and think about that boy in kindergarten, sitting at a table, small table, small chairs with Susan. She leaned over and goes, Todd, let's work on our words. And one of the words I could not say with my S's was speak. Thank you for allowing this guy tonight to be able to speak to you. Blessings and love to all. Thank you for letting me be here tonight. Wow. Uh, thank you, Todd, for sharing your story. Uh, I, for one, I'm glad to see that you know never gave up when you stuck to who you were. That's awesome. Uh, maybe one day you can show me uh, the little you know, the skills that you have with the drum. The closest thing oh, that I've had. The closest thing I had to drums is banging pencils on the table in the cafeteria in high school. Well, so. I'll be more happy to go jam sometime. <laughs> awesome, cool. Yeah. All right, so guys, if you uh, if you enjoyed uh, Todd's story as well, please uh, show your appreciation with the clap button uh, and reactions. Um, but uh, that does it uh, for for our show. Uh, we really appreciate you guys uh, being here. And uh, right now, we're going to bring up all of our uh, storytellers uh, to wave you guys uh, goodbye. Good job again, guys. You guys did great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, you guys are remarkable. <laughs> yeah, you guys are awesome. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, that does it for us, guys. Uh, we really hope that you uh, enjoyed this evening. Uh, we hope to see you at the next storytelling event. Bye. I'm going to keep looking at the screen. <laughs>